to be here. I was adopted nearly from birth, and like many adoptees, for years I dreamed of being able to meet my birth mother. My search began on my 18th birthday, and I was shocked to have been told on that day that that door was closed, that I would never have the opportunity to meet her, and that was very difficult for me. This was my information. <laughs> So I petitioned for what's called my non-identifying information. And when it arrived, it had everything you can imagine about my birth mother except for her name. It had her eye color, hair color, height, weight, age, the age of my half-brother and half-sister who were 11 and 13 when I was born, her ethnicity, religious background, occupation, educational level, detailed medical history. And I just hung on to every word. But then, for my father, it said that he was Caucasian and of large build. And that was it. And of course, I thought that sounds like a police description. And she couldn't even say his eye color, hair color, nothing. And I thought it over, what could the possible explanation be? So I called my caseworker and asked her, was my mom right? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. And I was just devastated. I remember feeling so ugly and unwanted, thinking, who would ever love me? Who's ever going to want to marry me and have a family with me? Because the explanation for my adoptive brother, who had been in and out of jail and prison from the age of 16, was that socially deviant behavior is genetic. What does that mean about do, who I am? Do I have this ugliness lurking inside of me? If I would give birth to a son someday, would he become a rapist? And I really believe that a nice guy would want to get involved with someone like me. And then, of course, at the same time, I thought about the issue of abortion. Because that's what you always hear about, right? Growing up, abortion wasn't talked about a whole lot in my family. When I was 12, my 16-year-old cousin had one. And I recall the discussions being that this was not a good thing. When I was 15, a year after my grandfather died, it was like the floodgates had opened. And for years, my grandmother would share this story that when she was pregnant with my aunt, who was the younger of her two children, that my grandfather had told her to go get an abortion. And she said, I never loved him again after that. How could they do that? How could they kill the babies? She said over and over again for years. And I now had a face to this issue. This was my aunt who I adored, I couldn't imagine. But I figured I just won't have one. And beyond that, it didn't affect my life, so I didn't give it much more thought. In high school, we studied this issue in the public school. And I remember other students bringing in for their speeches and presentations photos of aborted babies and being horrified. But I didn't identify with that. I didn't look at those images and think, oh, that could have been me. No, I thought it was just some sad story where she couldn't afford to keep me, but abortion doesn't apply to my life, I thought. I turn 18, I get this information, and it has to do with my very survival. It was as if I could hear the echoes of all those people who would say, I'm pro-life. Well, except in cases of rape. Hmm? Or I'm pro-choice, especially in cases of rape. And I realized that all those people were talking about me about my life, and I felt like I had at least half the world against me. That there's all these people who don't even know me who are standing in judgment of my life, so quick to dismiss it just because of how I was conceived. And I felt like I was now in a position where I would have to justify my own existence. That I would now have to prove myself to the world that I shouldn't have been aborted and that I was worthy of living. And then I had it all figured out that if somehow I could just meet her and if I could hear that maybe there was some mistake, that 
this was not how I was conceived, then again, I could feel good about myself and I could feel safe. Like, I wouldn't have to still feel like I was a target. I didn't want to be part of that classification conceived in rape. No, who would? So I ended up being one of the first people in Michigan to have a judge allow my caseworker to try to contact my birth mother and see if she wanted to meet me. And it worked. I was attending a college out of state at the time. I finally received a letter with my birth name, which was Judy Ann Miracle. So I was a miracle baby. I thought that was kind of cool. And then it had her name, Joanne, with her phone number. Trembling, I called her up. She said that she was sorry to hear that I already knew and then she proceeded to fill me in on some horrific details that I was totally unequipped to hear. She's 4'10", I don't know what that is in metrics, but really petite. Single mom heading to the grocery store at night right down the street from her, her home, and the guy jumped out of the bushes with a knife, dragged her to a field, and basically she went on to describe <coughs> for me in graphic detail how he brutally raped her. And that's how I was conceived. And that was so hard to hear for several reasons. First of all, to think that I was conceived out of a truly worst case scenario, I just felt totally worthless. Like garbage because of people who would say that my life was like garbage, that I was disposable. Then I had to realize that my biological father was a really bad man. She said she went to several police lineups but stopped going because she wouldn't recognize his face but that they knew that this was a serial rapist. And then all these years, I had really dreamed so much of meeting her. I had written poetry about meeting her. And so to hear that she had been violated like this really pained me. We arranged for me to fly home and meet her on her 51st birthday. And in the meantime, she sent me photos and a letter. And she wrote, my dearest Rebecca, hoping by now that the shock of finding out all the details of your birth are forgotten for that was not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were, nothing as precious as a baby. Mostly when you carry one nine months and you go through the birth all alone, feeling like no one loves you. But you were so perfect and pretty. All these years, I had nothing of you, nothing saying you were a part of me, just the memory of carrying a baby that I hoped one day would try to find her real mother as I always wanted to know my baby. You were always with me in my thoughts. You were always with me in my heart, mostly in July. It seems like a lifetime, I know. When I was sick two years ago, I thought I would never get to know my little girl. Would you please see if you can get me a copy of the letter you sent to the Oakland County judge? It made me cry. Also, I would like copies of your poems. These are things I would like to read. It's been a long three weeks looking forward to our meeting. I didn't know how to express my inner feelings, and she put in caps. It's so great, big, beautiful. It's always been my dream. I am so happy. I am crying. And she put in closing, a love that ate at me for 19 years, my daughter at last. <coughs> With love, your mom, Joanne. That was just all my dreams come true. I felt so affirmed, and I felt like, yes, I was wanted. I flew home, had a wonderful reunion weekend with her. The next day, she had a huge family reunion for me. I got to meet my half-brother, which was really weird to think we could have grown up together. Six years later, I met my half-sister when I flew down to Florida 
for a five generation photo. It was the fourth time in a row that they had five generations of women alive. I got to room with my grandmother at the time, which was so cool. But after this initial reunion weekend, I flew back to college. I went to a few meetings of Students for Life. I didn't get involved at that point because I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. I was making horrible choices in my life. But it gave me the courage and support I felt I needed to finally call her and ask her about abortion because I still needed to know. And she told me the truth that if abortion had been legal in Michigan at the time, that she would have aborted me. And I, I said, you don't mean it. You had to do it all over again, right? And she said, no. Well, what about everything you said in that letter? And her response to me was just, you don't know what it was like. And I know that that's true. But I also know that today she's okay. In fact, she's doing great. She has a wonderful husband, a beautiful home. And despite the utter horror of her saying that to me, I still chose to nurture a relationship with her, to honor her for the role that she did play in my life. And frankly, I just hoped that if I could prove myself good enough, that she would change her mind. Well, by the time she did change her mind about abortion six years later, I was at a really good place in my life. Now knowing my value, identity, and purpose in Christ, where I no longer needed to hear that for my own well-being, but it was still great to hear. I was with her when she was making baby clothes for my niece in Florida who was in an unplanned pregnancy with her first great grandchild. She said, I'm really glad she's having this baby. And I've changed my mind about all of that. Two days later, Norma McCormie, who is Jane Roe from Roe versus Wade, that's the landmark US Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion across the United States, she had announced the very same thing to our nation, that she had changed her mind about abortion after years of having worked in an abortion clinic, yet never actually having had one herself. You see, by the time her case reached the United States Supreme Court, she had already given birth and placed that child for adoption. And how nice that she can do that, change her mind, and still have the opportunity to enjoy a relationship with her child from that case. What about the millions of women since for whom changing their mind is the very painful realization that they will never have that opportunity here on Earth? Now, I ask pro-life activists and pro-life leaders all across the United States how many of you here know whether Jane Roe, Norma McCordy had a son or a daughter? And I'm amazed at how few people know. She had a daughter. This is not some fictitious, theoretical, philosophical, legal entity called a fetus, but a real person. And a woman, no less, who is walking the face of this earth, who was targeted for abortion in that case. Don't ever let people forget that we are talking about real people. One of my pet peeves in the pro-life movement is when you hear people say, it's a child, not a choice. No, he or she is a child, not a choice. They have a gender. And anytime you can use words of gender, even better yet, words of relationship, like sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, that helps to further humanize that child. I represented the mother in Michigan's frozen embryo case, and the doctors testified at deposition that from conception, they are literally male or female, and ascertainably so. So they are not an it, even 
in vitro, even from one cell. And as we know, it's always easier to dehumanize the enemy or, or to kill the enemy once you dehumanize them, right? And so pro-life people should never play into that and use that term, it. But to help you remember, it's just like it says in, in Genesis that in the beginning, God created the male and female. He created them. And right from our very beginnings, he creates us male or female. Now, I had, as I said, I had felt quite worthless when I first learned how I was conceived. I asked my adoptive father, you know, how do you feel about abortion and what about in cases of rape? And he had started to say to me, well, I've always felt like, who am I to say what a woman can or cannot do with her own body? Because I, I got to say I've always been pro-choice. But Dad, you watched me grow up 18 years. Like, you really mean to say that you really believe that her body, her choice, was more important than my whole entire life? Like, really, Dad? You really believe that? And it was like he instantly snapped out of it. He said, no, I don't believe that. Wow, how would I ever get to a point where I would believe such a thing? And he started to talk about how, as a professor on a liberal college campus, that it was just expected that if you were progressive-minded, you would be pro-choice. But he had never stopped to consider the ramifications of that position, particularly as an adaptive father. So I learned at a minimum at 18 that my story had the potential to change hearts and minds. But I still struggled with big picture worldview questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Who created me? And I ended up in some abusive relationships until eventually I was beat up by a boyfriend from law school. He broke my jaw. My front tooth was hanging. I had to have all kinds of surgery to have it put back in, root canal, to try to save it. I was told I could still end up losing my front tooth someday. And after 13 years, I had to have it pulled, which again was devastating. But I was speaking at a pregnancy center fundraiser in Alabama, and an expert in cosmetic dentistry came up to me afterwards and offered to do all of my teeth for free <laughs> as part of the Give Back a Smile program for victims of domestic violence. And he didn't just do the three with the bridge and fourth to match, but eight teeth with porcelain veneers. Wow. So. <laughs> I share that story with you because it is another example in my life where there was something that happened that was really, really awful. But then something beautiful came out of it. And isn't that what God is famous for? The worst evil that man has in store, God can take and use it for good. It's the story of Joseph in Egypt when his brothers sold him into slavery. We're told man intended this for harm, but God has used this for good. And God trades beauty for ashes. Now, I'm very thankful for this nice new set of teeth, but let me make one thing clear. That does not make me pro-domestic violence. <laughs> Just like being thankful for my life does not make me pro-rape. But people actually say that to me. They'll say, oh, so what you're saying is that if abortion had been legal, you wouldn't be here today. Well, you know, if your birth mother hadn't been raped, you wouldn't be here today either. So does that mean that you're pro-rape? People actually say that to me. And I explain to them that there's a huge moral difference because I did exist. And my life would have been ended because I would have been killed through a brutal abortion. I may not look the same as I did when I was four years old or four days old yet unborn in my mother's womb, but that was still undeniably me, and I would have been killed. That's a huge moral difference. And then they'll try to say, yeah, but that wouldn't have been you. Well, then who would it have been? <laughs> well, it just wouldn't have been you yet. Okay, so college campuses, high school assemblies. I asked the students, show me a sign. I want to see a sign of hands. 
How many of you here have ultrasound photos in your baby books at home? Well, maybe you haven't looked at them in a while, but I have those photos in my children's baby books. You know, what do your parents say to you? Do they say, I don't really know what that is. Like, I don't know, that's like some kind of glob of tissue, and I don't even know what it's doing in there. No, what do your parents say to you? They say, that was my baby. That was you, and the students finish the sentence. That was, they understand it, they get it, they see the connection, that was me. And I tell them, one day when you have children, you're gonna do the same thing. And I brought all my children with me for all of my ultrasounds. And they remember, I saw you when you were in mommy's belly. They understand it, but then somehow, when it comes to this issue of abortion, those same people will suddenly say, yeah, but that wouldn't have been you. Or, I don't know what that is. And it is complete intellectual dishonesty. Mm. My birth mother shared with me that she actually went to two illegal back alley abortions, and I was almost aborted. For the first, it was the typical back alley conditions that you hear about as to why she should have been able to safely and legally abort me. She said it was an OBGYN's office, and she had to go through the back door, and much like Gosnell's office today, you might have heard about it in um, Philadelphia, it was called the House of Horrors. Uh, this place was filthy. There was blood and dirt on the floor and on the tables. And those conditions and the fact that it was illegal caused her to back out, as it did with most women. And then it was arranged for her, once again, to go to a more expensive abortionist. She said there were no pregnancy resource centers back then, but if there had been, she would have gone. But she wasn't given any other option, any other help or hope. And so this time she was to meet someone at night by the Detroit Institute of Arts, ironically next to Cezanne's Thinker statue. Someone would approach her, say her name, blindfold her, put her in the back seat of a car, then take her and abort me, blindfold her again, and drop her back off. And she was told that if she was further along than thought, or if there were any complications, they would have to keep her overnight. And she was terrified for her own safety. <coughs> but she was prepared to go through with it. The night that she was to abort me, my aunt was going to drive her. She spoke with this abortion doctor on the phone, expressed concern for her safety, she worried about who would take care of her son and daughter if anything happened to, to her. And he called her stupid. She said, well, if you're gonna call me names, just forget it. And he went on to swear at her profusely. And then she finally just hung up the phone on him. He called her back the next day to try to once again talk her into allowing him to take my life for $500. And the same conversation took place. I can't even tell you what it feels like to know that somebody wanted to take my life so badly to pocket $500 to even, even call back the next day. There is a film that is the number one documentary. It's a black and white film on VHS. It's in feminist studies at universities all over the country in the US. And it's the only documentary done on the Back Alley Network before Roe vs. Wade. The name of this documentary is Back Alley Detroit. I could watch this film and see those men who would have taken my life. I know the time, place, manner, how much money of my impending death. You know, for some people, their near-death experience is waking up out of a coma to find out that they were almost killed in an automobile accident. For me, this is my life-changing near-death experience. And the fact that I was younger doesn't make it any less real or any less significant. And I was not lucky. I was protected.
legality matters. And I am so thankful that my life was spared. But a lot of well-meaning people would say, oh, God really meant for you to be here. But I know that God intends for every unborn child to be given that same opportunity. And it's not like I can stand here and say, I deserved it. Look, look what I've done with my life. And millions of others didn't. I can't do that. The trial date in Roe versus Wade was exactly 10 months after my birth date. The US Supreme Court decision was, was exactly three and a half years to my birth date. I just barely made it, but I know that my life was spared for a purpose. And the most selfish thing would be to just live my life and who cares about the rest? I feel like I was spared from a burning building. And as I have the opportunity to go back and save others, I'm going to do it. I owe my birth like I said to the law being there to protect me because of pro-life advocates, activists, leaders, legislators in Michigan who, without even knowing of my exact existence, yet recognized that mine was a life worth saving. And they did so by making sure that abortion was illegal in Michigan, even in cases of rape. 100% pro-life, no exceptions, no compromise. They are my hero. And I owe my birth to them protecting me. If your mother chose life for you, how nice for you. But mine didn't, she chose abortion. Pro-life advocates chose life for me, and some of us are in need of heroes. My organization is Save the One. This is the poster, this is the logo we use, and it is proud to say it's biblically based, but it's also based upon a motto within the pro-life movement in the United States. We have a problem with this saying that you save the 99 in exchange for the one. It's the burning building analogy. Wouldn't you save as many as you can while working to save all? Okay, first of all, they're not working to save all. What they do is they shut the water off, they send the fire trucks home, and they stand there watching the building burn down with the one inside of it. Tell me what you're doing to, to, to save the one that's left behind. They're not. We've had the Hyde Amendment, which is the defunding of abortion, uh, federal funding of abortion, except there's been the rape exception for more than 20 years now. It didn't always have the rape exception. And they never talk about going back to remove that exception. And whenever I hear the 99 and the one, I can't help but think of the parable of the lost sheep. Because Jesus was all about saving the one. And in context, he specifically was talking about little ones who are despised and are at, are at risk of being killed. He said, see that you do not despise any of these little ones. What a strange thing to say. Who would despise a little one? Okay, well, we are called demon seed, evil seed, horrible reminder of the rape, raper's child, demon spawn, monster's child. You don't ever hear us called rape victim's child. And they'll say, oh, well, it is a biological truth that you are, you know, the child of a rapist, right? Well, it's also a biological truth that I'm a child of a rape victim, but you didn't say that, did you? No, you want to demonize me. You don't call Obama a child of a polygamist. <laughs> but they do it, they say it because we are despised. They'll say we're tainting the gene pool and on and on. And then Jesus went on to say, For I tell you, there are angels in heaven always look upon the face of my Father in heaven. And then he goes into the whole parable of the lost sheep where the good shepherd leaves the 99 to save the one. 
And then he ends the parable by saying, for in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any, any of these little ones should perish, and neither should we. This is the heart of God. Who are the least of these of whom Christ spoke? Are they not the ones who are forsaken and marginalized? <coughs> That's the heart of God. And I explain to people what's actually happening in the burning building analogy is that you have firefighters who are going in for job interviews. And the firefighters are the legislators, candidates, right? And they're going for, in for job interviews with pro-life leaders. And they're telling them, uh, just so you know, I discriminate. Yeah, when I go into a burning building, if there's a child who's in the midst of the fire in the back of the building, um, not that it would be any risk to my life, it's just that I'm not going to save that child. Because, you know, if you think about it, they're already going to be disfigured and they're going to end up being a horrible reminder of the fire. Okay, sound familiar? We get called horrible reminder of the rape. And I'm just not, I'm not going to do that to their parents, so I'm not going to save them. Okay, what fire chief in his right mind would hire that firefighter? But that is, in fact, what they are doing in the United States. Not where I'm from, not Michigan. We've never had a rape exception in a single law. Mm -hmm. And not Georgia Rights Life, where I just spoke Thursday night, and I know that you guys aren't doing it either. You're the good fire chief. And so... Um, what, and can you imagine when, in fact, the firefighter gets some other firefighters to agree with them, and they kind of unionize, and they stand there and say, um, we're not going to go in and save any unless you agree to let us discriminate. I mean, that's what happens in U.S. Congress. They can't get anything passed. Even with the rape exception, they still can't get it passed. Because they had a reporting requirement, which wasn't even a real reporting requirement. And then they got that removed. They don't get anything done. They're complete failures because they're supporting these mediocre politicians who don't really care about saving lives. And if you have a firefighter who's going to do that, they're not your guy who's going to go in and save lives. And when they, in fact, do that and then they leave the one behind, again, what good fire chief wouldn't immediately terminate their employment? But that, sadly, is what's happening in the United States. And so my organization is made up of over 400 like me now who are conceived in rape, mothers from rape, post-aborted from rape, regret aborting, or um, birth mothers from rape, or incest. And then we have hundreds from our carry to birth division, people who were given a challenging prenatal diagnosis and told to abort. The so-called hard cases in the abortion debate. And I say so-called because how would you like to be called a hard case? If you knew us, you know that we're easy to love. You know who the hard cases are? They're all of those with the hardened hearts. They're the tough nuts to crack. They're the hard cases, not us. I, as I said, I ended up um, becoming an attorney. I litigated numerous high-profile cases on uh, defending human life. This has definitely been God's call on my life. Um, it's been an honor to do this kind of work and to meet people across the globe with these stories. Um, we get our stories translated into Spanish. We have an incredible Spanish team. In just one year, we have 20,000 followers on Facebook, and we don't pay for followers. And then now our Portuguese page is growing as well because there's such a need for these resources, for these stories across the world. And it's important that our voices get heard and that our stories get told. Um, I want to share uh, one last story because people like to hear this one. Um, do you all know who <coughs> Governor Rick Perry is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was the governor of Texas, 
And <laughs> four years ago, four and a half years ago, I was in a film called The Gift of Life with Governor Mike Huckabee. It's a Citizens United film. Mine is one of several stories featured in that film. And so I had premiere, I had backstage passes to the premiere in glamorous Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and there were four presidential candidates who spoke at that premiere. Michelle, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, um, former Speaker of the House of the Congress, uh, Newt Gingrich, Senator, former Senator Rick Santorum, and Governor of Texas, Rick Perry. I introduced myself to each one of them. I told them that I'm the spokeswoman for personhood. And right away, Bachman and Santorum said, oh, I signed the personhood pledge. I said, yes, I know, thank you so much. It was a no exceptions, no compromise pledge for the presidential candidates. It came out two, two days before and they both immediately signed it. But Perry and Gingrich had not yet signed it and they were both rape exception candidates. I handed them each my DVDs, Conceived and Rape from Worthless to Priceless, and our group DVD, Except in Cases of Rape, 12 Stories of Survival, and I gave them my business card, Conceived and Rape Targeted for Abortion. You know, subtle. <laughs> <laughs> and right away, Governor Perry was stunned. He said, this is your story? and I shared with him how I was conceived and almost aborted. And he asked me, can I have your autograph? <laughs> no. He said, no, I mean it. And he hands me a marker and says, here, make it out to my daughter. So I wrote, 100% pro-life, Rebecca Kiesling. And then he asked me more questions and I shared with him about some of the cases, how I had litigated these high profile cases um, and how I have this network of others that I mentor and get stories published. And he said to me, you know, you're my heroine. <coughs> wow, thank you so much. But it's funny you say that. <laughs> Because my question for you is, would you be my hero? And I shared with him again what I shared with you that I'm alive today because of leaders, legislators who are my heroes who protected me. No exception, even in the case of rape. And I asked him again, would you be my hero? And he said, yes, yes, I, I would. <coughs> But you make that rape exception. And he put his head down and he said, oh, wow, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. <laughs> he was thinking about it. I didn't know how much time I'd have with him. Other people were waiting. And I said, I wanted to get my photo taken with you, but my battery's dead. He said, well, I have my own personal photographer. Come with me. And we went back into his green room where they took tons of pictures, which he never sent me, uh, although they used my picture in one of his campaign ads. And he said, he kept looking at the photo saying, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And I looked up at him and I explained that when you make that rape exception, that's like saying to me that I deserve the death penalty for the crimes of my biological father. The US Supreme Court said that he didn't even deserve the death penalty. There's no death penalty for rapists. They said that even for child molesters, it's cruel and unusual punishment. He was nodding his head. And I asked him, but you believe that I, the innocent child, deserved the death penalty? And he said, no, no, I, I don't. And I'm like, <laughs> and he stopped me. He said, you know, tonight's event and this film are supposed to be all about changing hearts and minds. And right now, you're changing my heart. And I thought, hmm, changing? 
Like, what's that supposed to mean? And I had all kinds of friends on Facebook telling me that they were praying for me, saying, you're going to have an Esther moment. I just know it. You're going to have an Esther moment for such a time as this. And I was not about to miss it. <laughs> so I challenged him. No more rape exceptions. And he looked me in the eyes and he promised no more rape exceptions. And I thought, yes. <laughs> and he just said that he had never put a face to the issue before, that he had never considered it from the perspective of someone like me. He's the governor of Texas running for president. You think he's never heard the arguments before? But again, it goes to show what stories can do to pierce the heart in ways in which arguments cannot. The next day, he signed the personhood pledge, and so did Newt Gingrich. And he went on national television four times talking about our conversation, how my story pierced his heart, saying he could not look me in the eyes and justify the rape exception any longer. So let me tell you, if you can change the heart of a governor during a presidential campaign, you can change the heart of anyone. Do not be afraid to speak up. Do not be afraid to tell people why it is that you would be at a conference like this and why you care about protecting the unborn. And if you have personal stories within your family, sometimes those are very painful, very difficult stories, but do not be afraid to share those because if we all spoke up and shared those personal stories, we could change our community, change our culture, change the world. Um, one quick last story. On my birthday a couple of years ago, my grandmother died on my birthday. My, my birth mother called to wish me happy birthday and to tell me the news. I had been born on my grandma's anniversary, and then she died on my birthday. And we had a long heart to heart. I told her I would fly home. I was on family vacation, but I would fly home to be with her. And at the end of this long conversation, she stopped me. And she said, Rebecca, Rebecca, I just want to say, I'm so glad I have you. That was the best birthday gift decades after she had sought to end my life, and a couple of decades after she was telling me it should have been my right, she was able to say that to me. And just know that when you get involved in the pro-life movement, just know that this is not a theoretical exercise, that maybe you might be there are going to be women in your community who are one day going to be able to say to their children, I'm so glad I had you because of the work that you're doing. Thank you.